Okay, let us start. Thank you for continuing to attend ECS 173. Uh, we have just finished talking about approaches for segmenting images into collections of pixels called segments, uh, and the problem is called segmentation. So now that we've solved that general problem, let's move on to something a little bit different called texture analysis. Now, uh, the way I described it to you last, in the last couple of lectures, one of the key questions that you need to answer when you determine whether or not to put pixels into one cluster or one category is uh, how to decide sort of a distance measure between pairs of pixels, or what is the feature of those pixels that is going to tell you whether they belong together or not. And I said kind of nonchalantly that texture can be one of those. You say, well, you can have some measurement of whether or not two pixels have the same texture or not. And if they have the same texture, they belong in the same category, and if not, not. So I think we're going to go dig a little bit deeper into this concept of what it means for two pixels to have the same visual texture and um, how to take some semantic notions of that and stuff them into mathematics as is our usual custom. Okay, so let's start with the general question of what do I mean by the term texture? What does visual texture refer to? Remember, in common everyday English, texture can refer to either tactile texture, which is what sandpaper feels like as separate from what velvet feels like, uh, and visual texture, which is to say, uh, what is it about how polka dots look that make them different from what plaid looks like? So uh, for our purposes, a texture or a visual texture is going to be a visual pattern of repeated elements. So this is the key notion is that there are certain elements in a texture that are repeated. Now, each one of those elements do not necessarily look identical to each other. And the placement of those elements is not necessarily identical from element to element. But there is some amount of regularity in the appearance of each one of those elements and the relative positioning of adjacent elements. So um, a perfectly regular texture of polka dots, or of, uh, yeah, of polka dots, would be something like a circle that is perfectly black on a white background. And there are a repeated pattern of those where all of the spacings in between the circles are identical between pairs in both directions. So it looks just like a perfectly regular pattern of polka dots. Now, the leopard that you see here does not have that perfect pattern of dots, but you would still call that a repeated pattern of elements. The only difference is that there's some variability in terms of how circular each one of the dots are, and to some extent, uh, what the relative spacing in between the dots are. So it's not a perfectly regular pattern, but it, you'd still fall into the category of texture because there is this repeated element of a dot that gets placed over and over again on whatever it appears on. Similarly, uh, we don't usually think of um, the side of a building as being a visual texture, but really it is because there is one element called a window who's, uh, who keeps getting repeated over and over again, and this time it's at fairly even uh, intervals without much variability in terms of the placement. But there is some variability in the appearance, and basically what that amounts to is that the shades might be a more up or down depending on which window you're looking at. The um, thing in the bottom middle is a top-down view at a grocery stand of, uh, of a, a bunch of bell peppers. And as you can see, there's basically one kind of element, which is a bell pepper, that keeps getting repeated over and over again at, at intervals that, are, that vary a little bit from pepper to pepper, but not by much. So these are the key notions in a texture. You have one type of element that is repeated over and over again. And the thing that varies from element to element is both how it appears and its relative positioning with respect to the other ones. There's a number of reasons why we want to take this notion of texture and quantify it in various ways. It's a useful cue, first of all, for detection and segmentation. So simply put, there are some objects that are discriminated from their background based on their textures. 
and a zebra is a perfect example. It's the thing that really tells you that some part of the image corresponds to a zebra as opposed to a background is the fact that it's stripy. Even if it's a completely black and white, it doesn't even have to have levels of gray. It's just a binary black and white image. And you see this characteristic striping, you'll know it's a zebra. And similarly with the, with the butterflies. And in fact, um, one of the neat things you can do is make a rendering of how butterfly wings look to another butterfly. And it's this really amazing, vivid uh, visual texture that's like a huge advertisement for, for the other butterfly to come over and, and mate with this butterfly. Uh, and textures, in this sense, are all over the natural world as, as useful cues. Uh, in very, very practical sense, especially in medicine, texture can be a useful cue for detecting things like diseases or different types of tissues or entities of interest from medical images. So for us, at least for me, it's hard for me to uh, come up with a description in my own mind of what it is that discriminates these cells from a microscopy image from these cells but it turns out that if you biopsy these cells, these cells are the ones that are more likely to die in short order. So these are very close to necrosis, called a morgue. And these are ones with a good prognosis. So these cells are in good shape, and they're going to last for a long time. And while we don't usually think of these kinds of images as displaying a particular kind of visual texture, they really do. And if you compare each one of these cells with a photograph of something like a sponge, I mean like a normal kitchen sponge taken close up, they actually look quite similar. And it's because there's this characteristic repeated pattern of white blobs and dark blobs. And yeah, there is a lot of variability in terms of the number, or sorry, the, the size of each one of the white blobs and the size of each one of the black blobs, but it still has this white to dark uh, pattern to it. And in fact, if you were to take a photograph from a, a lunar lander of the surface of the moon, it would have this similar kind of splotchy pattern, which again goes back to this notion of visual texture. That the thing that tells you that this is a cell as opposed to a piece of wood is the repeated pattern of white and dark blobby elements. And it turns out that if you use sophisticated tools for quantifying the visual texture of these guys, and quantifying the visual texture of these guys, you can actually tell what's different about the texture of this one as opposed to this one, and thereby be able to tell just from imaging, not from biopsy. Biopsy, by the way, is where you stick a needle in something and pull out some of the tissue and uh, analyze it using um, some other kind of technique. In other words, this is a fast way of using visual texture to tell whether someone's got happy, good cells or sick, dying cells. It turns out, too, that uh, whether you realize you're doing it or not, you oftentimes use visual texture as a cue, as a source of information for other aspects of the world. So really, in this photograph here, uh, really the only thing you can see in it are the circles and the fact that the circles are deformed in some way. It's obviously a texture because there is this one repeated element called a black circle that keeps getting repeated over and over and over again. And yet, even though all you can see is texture, you can't, you can't tell that it has any depth to it. You can't tell what the shape of the object is, uh, but really you can, okay? So in your mind, you're not assuming that there is a perfectly flat piece of cloth that has had this pattern printed onto it. In your mind, you're probably thinking that there was a piece of cloth that had one of the exact same kind of circle pattern onto it over and over again in a two-dimensional array pattern, and that that piece of cloth has been deformed. And depending on how you choose to look at it, um, you might choose to think that the four corners of the fabric have been pinned down and the middle has been pulled out towards you, or you can choose to think that the middle of the thing has been pulled back away from you, depending on your perspective. But in any, in any rate, if you assume that that started out as a perfectly regular pattern, 
with the same size and shape of circle printed over and over again on the piece of cloth, then you can use texture and how the texture has been deformed to tell you something about shape. And similarly, um, you know, it is possible that there exists a building, a skyscraper, say, that has been built with um, floors that are not flat. So, for example, you can, you can imagine that someone has built a kind of uh, crazy Winchester mansion type skyscraper in which the, um, the walls kind of go like this, and the windows are not in a straight row but are going like so. And this would be a photograph of that kind of a building. However, we don't usually see that kind of skyscraper in cities, do we? Instead, what we see are skyscrapers that are built with each window being a rectangle in a straight line at, a, at an even pattern with respect to each other. Um, and if you were to take a photograph of that kind of a building from a certain point of view and it looked like this, then you could use that, just that photograph by itself, and your prior knowledge about how skyscrapers tend to be built to tell you something about your point of view. So for example, if uh, this corner of the building is on the street corner, then you know that you're something like kitty corner to that street corner. You're at a 45 degree angle where this is one of the corners of the building and this is one of the two walls. So again, the only reason that you were able to come to that conclusion is because you have prior knowledge about what buildings tend to look like and you analyze the visual texture of the windows. So visual texture can tell you about the deformation of things, about what point of view you're at, and this is just another example in which technically it is possible that someone has printed out a piece of fabric in which not all of these flowers are the same size and shape, but that the ones in the middle are kind of deformed, and furthermore that afterwards someone has taken the, this gray piece of fabric and magic markered it so that part of it is dark. But come on, you know better than that. You know that this is probably a piece of fabric where every flower is exactly the same size and shape, placed in a regular pattern, and that it has been deformed. So you can use visual texture to infer things about how things are shaped, oriented, where you are in the world, how it's deformed. And in fact, whether you are conscious of this fact or not, you are doing this all the time when you look at something like my shirt. You can basically tell how folded it is and how I am deforming it just based on how the visual texture appearance changes. Now, for those of you who are interested in graphics, movies, and games, um, texture analysis, actually, it, it could be that there's even more focus and emphasis on synthesizing new textures than there is on analyzing what kinds of textures appear in an image. And in particular, imagine that you have uh, a photograph of a sponge and you are, oh, what's a good example? You are writing a video game in which one of the levels that you have to go through is sponge world. So instead of just having one little spot of a sponge in your world, you need to have, what's a good example, you need to have an entire 50 foot long uh, Great Wall of China made out of sponge. I don't know, I just made that up. But if you did, then you, what, one thing you might want to do is start with this initial image of a sponge and replicate it over and over and over and over and over again. Now if you've ever tried to take a photograph and simply make copies of it and put them side by side by side by side, what you'll notice is that there are these edges. Anybody on Earth will be able to tell you where the seam is between your previous photo of the sponge and the one that you placed right next to it. And furthermore, even if you kind of cover up that seam, it'll be obvious that it, this is not just one gigantic sponge that was manufactured, but that it was the same sponge placed over and over and over again. Human beings, for some reason, are really good at being able to decipher textures in this way. So what you really want to do is take your initial photograph of a sponge, identify what the uh, salient characteristics of it are, and use it to generate de novo entirely new photographs that have the same general properties as your initial image but are different in some little way. So this image of uh, the sponge uh, 
actually, well, okay, so these two are, are parts of the initial one, but you can imagine having a new image that's completely different. And that's shown at the bottom there, where really none, no sub piece of this image is present in that one, but hopefully you can see that it shares the characteristics of that kind of uh, uh, wallpapery pattern. And similarly, this is not the same exact weave pattern just replicated over and over again. It's a new, entirely different thing. But it has the same characteristics of that initial sample. So this is why texture analysis is useful for anybody who does video games or movies. Now, here's another one of these axes that I'm very fond of. Uh, it turns out that um, you, as the engineer, need to determine where your text, let's say that you want to either detect a particular texture in a photograph or analyze it or synthesize a new one, what you need to do is consider where your texture of interest lies along this axis between regular textures on one end and what I'm calling stochastic textures on the other hand. So perfectly regular textures are things like a checkerboard where every element, here an element would be a black square next to a white square, Every element looks exactly the same as all the other ones. And uh, the placement of all adjacent, uh, the, the placement of all these elements are perfectly regular. So the distance between any one of these elements, no matter how you quantify it, is identical aqu across all elements. And each black square is exactly as black as the other black square, and every white square is exactly as white as the other black square, or as the other white square. So there's, it's perfectly, perfectly regular. As you go from that, okay, so that's one end of our spectrum. And on the other end is something like what your television looks like when you unhook the antenna. Snow, it's com fairly, completely random. It's really difficult to actually identify what the individual elements are that are being repeated over and over again because the appearance of each one of the elements changes so much from, from one instance to the next and the relative placing of them changes so much from one element to the next. So in this one, there's a ton of variability in appearance of the individual elements and there's a ton of variability in how they're placed in the image. In fact, uh, in cases like this, it's not even a useful thing to think about what the individual elements are because it's just so complicated. And then somewhere, and I'm calling that stochastic textures, and we'll talk about those more in a minute. Uh, somewhere in between here are, are things like this photograph of the tomatoes where there is an identifiable element that keeps getting repeated over and over again. It's a tomato. But not all the tomatoes look exactly the same as each other for one thing. They have different sizes and shapes, and they reflect light in different ways. And they're not placed in a perfect grid going from left to right and top to bottom. The spacing between the individual elements is somewhat, um, is somewhat variable as well. Similar thing with this photograph of the pebbles. I would, you know, it, it, it's not, it doesn't fall under regular textures. It doesn't fall under stochastic textures either. I would call them near regular textures or somewhat regular textures. It turns out that if you go through the, the literature on this topic or if you look at the toolbox of uh, computational tools that are available for you to analyze textures, they tend to be either optimized for this kind of image or for this kind of image and they kind of fall apart for the stuff in the middle. So in fact, one of the current research areas that is moving forward right now is uh, how to analyze these kind of textures that are in the middle. Near regular or not quite regular textures. Okay, but let's talk about regular textures and how they are dealt with uh, typically. So more formally, what we do when we talk about regular textures is we consider something like an alphabet of texture elements. Now, each one of these texture elements is called a texton. So you can think about your set of textons as being your set of letters. And I should say in both of these cases of stochastic textures and regular textures, we contemplate a, the process of how that texture was generated in the first place. 
it's kind of an abstract notion because uh, for something like your um, your set of tomatoes, it's not the case that someone put the basket of tomatoes at the farmer's market together by starting with one tomato and replicating it over and over again and placing it in a particular way. They just kind of randomly fell out that way. But this is sort of your model for how the image came to look the way it did. So the way you think about it is that uh, basically, in order to generate a new image of a regular texture, you replicate your textons or you draw elements from your textons and you replicate them over and over again on some kind of a regular grid. So then if you want to identify the fact that a particular texture is present in the image, your job basically has two elements. First, to detect each of the textons in the image and identify what the transformations are amongst them. So basically, your, your sort of generative model for your image, if you will, is to start with one of your textons, transform it in some way, whether it's geometrically or in terms of its color or something, and place it on the image. Then you pick another texton, transform it in some other way, and place it in the image. And these are some examples of this. So in this case, we've basically got this is low resolution, sorry about that, but there's basically two textons, a T and an L. And for this image, what they did is they basically randomly selected, flipped a coin as to whether it's going to be a T or an L. The first one was a T, and then they randomly rotated it to some orientation, like that, and then went on to the next location in their regular grid. Flipped a coin again, it's a T again, and they rotated it to some random degree. And they did that over and over and over again. You see there's some T's, some L's, and they're all at random orientations. So again, what we would do in practice, let's say that instead of it being T's and L's, it was red bell peppers and green bell peppers. Our job would basically be to identify what the fact that each element in our image was a green bell pepper or a red bell pepper, and then identify what the transformation was between some canonical red bell pepper and the one that you see in the image. And when I say what the transformation is, it basically be to identify the fact that this is a T that's been rotated to the right 90 degrees. Textons. So um, in a more general image, this is basically a way of thinking about near regular textures in a way that's modular. So if you have a near regular texture like this one, the way you can think about it as doing those first two steps of identifying what the textons are and identifying what the transformations of each texton from some canonical element are and adding to it one more piece, which is identifying what the deformation of your regular grid is. So what I've told you is that you start out with a regular grid, you identify one of your textons, you transform it, and you plop it onto the image. And then you repeat at your next grid element and your next grid element and your next grid element. If you have a, a texture that is not perfectly regular like this one, then all you simply do is, as a first step, start with your regular grid and deform it in some way. And that's shown here. So for this one, we started with our initial process of identifying, in this case, I think there are just two textons, which are basically the dark, blurry green thing and then the blurry green thing with a yellow highlight. And as you can see, not each one of these textons are identical to each other. And it turns out that they alternate with each other. That's not such a huge deal. So there's the yellowy one, and then there's the dark green one, and the yellowy one, and the dark green one. And they've all been transformed in some way and placed on this perfectly regular grid. So then to get our image, all we do is deform the grid, which is to say we move grid points up or down, kind of stretching each one, almost like one of our deformable contours that we talked about, until we end up with this image on the right. So uh, if your job is to identify or analyze near regular textures, you now have three jobs. One is to identify where the textons are. Another one is to identify how they've been transformed from some canonical, uh, from some canonical version of that texton. And third, to identify what is the deformation that took you from a perfectly regular grid like this to your deformed grid like this one.
Does this make sense? Regular textures. Now you have three jobs. Uh, near regular textures, I should say. And similarly for the buildings, uh, you can think about, I didn't show the undeformed version of this, but you can, you can think about this as, being, as starting with a, uh, an image that just looks like one wall of the skyscraper where all of the elements are perfectly aligned on a rectangular grid. And what has happened here is that we've then deformed the image to push the middle up, making this a basically a near regular texture. The top one is easier because there's almost no variability across windows in how they look. So that transformation of the texton from its canonical version to the one you see in the image is really quite mild. There's no real transformation at all. Now, um, automatically detecting near regular textures is hard, but one way to start, um, or one way to address it, is to start with the idea of identifying interesting regions. So an algorithm was developed somewhat like the uh, approach we talked about in class for identifying interesting regions. And each one of these circles or ellipses represents one of the interesting regions. And again, these are based on the idea that an interesting region should be relatively rare, relatively um, repeatable, and relatively um, isolated. But let's just say that instead of trying to find a small number of interesting regions, we just try to find all the interesting regions in the image. And one way you could do this, for example, is to look for corners. And if a region is especially cornery, then you call that interesting. Now what you should be able to do is look at this set of ellipses on the right and determine that the set of ellipses that you have identified that correspond to your interesting regions form a kind of pattern. It's not perfect, it's somewhat complicated, but it forms a pattern. You can see that there are these long, skinny ellipses that are in a fairly regular pattern. And there are these more round ones that are also in a fairly regular pattern. So what you can do is basically identify where the interesting regions are and then try to link these up into a regular grid. And this is what's done in practice. It's not hard, and it really depends on your interesting region detector being really, really good at its job. But it's one way to do it. And linking these things together into a grid is not the easiest thing in the world, especially if your interesting region detector drops one or the other of the windows. Here's another example of that same thing where you can hopefully, if you look to the left and look to the right and look to the left and look to the right enough times, you should be able to notice that uh, wherever there are, wherever there's a flower on the left, you see a group of somewhere between three and four big interesting regions on the right. So there's one, there's one, there's one. There are these two that are kind of in the middle. And so it shouldn't be too much of a stretch to think that you can then do clustering, which we've also talked about, to group these interesting regions together and then link them together into some kind of a uh, grid. In this case, because it's such a natural scene, um, it's not clear that there is a regular grid um, in, in the x and y directions that was used to generate this particular image. So this is a hard case. But at any rate, you should be able to detect that there are repeated elements, namely the flowers, that are repeated over and over again. OK, so before I talk about stochastic textures, uh, I'll stop for any administrative questions. I don't really have any announcements. Any questions about the um, homework or the office hours or anything? OK, good. Um, then in that case, we will continue and talk about stochastic textures. So basically, what I've told you is that every visual texture can be thought of in terms of textons. In other words, every visual texture consists of a set of basic elements that are transformed in some way in terms of their geometry and their appearance, and then repeated over and over and over again in the image. Well, 
For stochastic textures, like the snow pattern on your television, this is technically true, but it's practically not useful. And in fact, the variability, I mean, you, what you would have to do to, to think about these as textons is to think of each pixel on your TV as being a, one of the textons, whose appearance can vary all the way from perfectly bright to perfectly dark. So it's not practically useful as a way to um, describe the texture in a quantitative way. So what has been done to deal with textures that are highly, highly variable in this way is to think about a model, a kind of a machine or a box that generates images of this texture. So this is like a black box. You just try not to think about what is inside the box. And what it does is that if you're given an image of something like the snow pattern on your television, what this texture model does is it basically spits out patches of that image and then places them uh, adjacent to each other. So if there's a button on it, you can think about every time you press the button, it spits out a new image patch that corresponds to that particular uh, texture. You press the button again, you get another image patch. Now, uh, one thing that is natural to do if you're a statistician is to think about the probability that you're going to get any particular image patch. So if you think about the entire world of all possible image patches that consists of all possible combinations of image intensities, some of them are going to be probable and some of them are going to be improbable. And in, in fact, if you have, if this model corresponds to the noise pattern on your television, then image patches like this are going to be relatively probable and image patches that look like this are going to be relatively improbable because you don't have snow patterns on your antenna-less television that tend to look like this. You could, but it would be really, really unlikely because it would look like a zebra, not snow. So we think about this kind of abstract black box model that spits out patches of our stochastic texture. So, um, you know, we try not to think about the details of this generation process. We really had a recipe for regular textures which was to start with a texton, transform it, put it down, start with another texton, transform it, put it down on the image, and then deform the grid. We're not thinking about that generative process. We're just thinking about it as, in terms of a black box. All we know is that some patches are probable and some patches are improbable. And that's how we describe a particular texture like the snow pattern on the television as distinct from the pattern of a gru or of crevasses on a sponge. So, um, what the name of the game really, in order to identify a particular texture in an image, is to determine what black box it came from. Did it come from the snow pattern on your television black box, or did it come from the uh, the sponge-like black box? And we're going to identify that for every patch in the image. And the way we kind of determine that this group of image patches hangs together as being highly probable from one of these models and that these patches hang together as part of this model is to, is to determine what features are common across them. So we're going to quantify certain features that are important for discriminating one type of texture from the other. And as usual, as we've talked about, the features that we associate with each one of these image patches are going to be numerical vectors that try to capture the salient characteristics of the image signal in those image patches. So now, uh, if we have those features, the idea is that for any new image patch, we're going to answer the question of, given its features, does it seem more probable that it was generated by this texture model or by this texture model? Given my set of image features, does it look more likely that the television snow model spat it out or that the sponge model spat it out? So this is why, this is how we are forced to think about stochastic textures because the texton approach is just way too complicated. It's too difficult. Does this make sense? Okay.
So now I'll tell you some of the things about some of the image features that have been used in the past to describe textures and discriminate them from each other. One of them is very simply to look at what's called the intensity histogram of the patch. So if I have one of these image patches, what I can do is take all of the pixels in them and then count how many of those pixels have intensity zero. And then just have a histogram where the height of the bar is higher if there are more pixels that have that intensity. So, um, or actually it's the other way around. So how many pixels are perfectly black dark? This many, let's say that's 20. And how many pixels have an intensity of one that's just barely a little bit less dark than that? That many, let's say 15, or yeah, 15. And, uh, and so on, how many pixels have intensity of two, 10 of them, and so on and so forth. And what you should see is that there are, are very, very few, none in fact, of very, very bright pixels in that patch, and there's relatively few of them that are even medium bright. So if I have, the, so if I look at two separate patches of the same rock texture, it's a zoomed in photograph of, of a rock kind of pebble garden, then what I will see is that the two histograms of intensities for those patches look very similar to each other. And if I then compare that to the corresponding intensity histogram for this bush, you should see qualitatively that it's quite different. So now, one idea is that if we have some canonical image patch intensity histogram for each one of our textures, whether it's pebbles or bushes, then we can take a new one from a new image patch like this one and compare it to our canonical pebble garden histogram. And if we have some numerical way of quantifying the difference between two histograms, then that we can use that as a measurement of how much the new image patch looks like rock garden. So then the, the question of whether a particular image patch corresponds to using my earlier example, snow from your television or sponges, boils down to does the intensity histogram for my patch of, of image look more like the intensity histogram for snow versus uh, sponge. And there are numerous different ways to quantify the difference between two histograms. This is just one such measure. It's called the chi-squared measure. It's very common in, in the statistical world. But there are numerous different ways to quantify the difference between intensity histograms. And chi-squared does the right thing here, where it says that the difference between these two histograms is only 0.1, and the difference between these two histograms is 0.8. It's relatively high. And in fact, the bottom thing is what happens if you slide a window that's this big through the image, and for each such image patch, you generate an intensity histogram like that one and compare it to your canonical one from one such image patch. Where white means that the difference is relatively low between that patch's intensity histogram and your canonical one, and dark means that it's relatively far away. So it does this intuitive thing where most of the patches in the rock garden, uh, their intensity histogram looks similar to that of our canonical rock garden intensity histogram. And most of the pixels on the bush, their intensity histogram looks different. So we can use these histograms as our feature vectors that we use to discriminate patches of one texture from patches of another. Another thing we can do, and this goes way, way back to the early 80s, is to use what's called a co-occurrence matrix as a complex but relatively compact descriptor of the contents of an image patch. So let's consider a matrix, which I'll call Pij. For each element xy in this Pij, it tells you how many pixels with intensity x have a pixel at intensity y, that is i columns to the right and j rows below that, that pixel of interest. So it's basically uh, the ij tells you uh, how two pixels are relatively placed with respect to each other. And the xy tells you 
how different their intensities are. So there's a big, large space of these of these histograms. Uh, or sorry, of these of these so-called co-occurrence matrices. So what you have to do is decide which of the I's, J's, of the I's and J's you're interested in. And you can use a set of these as a really kind of hard to visualize but very, very rich in information descriptor for your, um, for your image patch and the texture that's in it. And actually, this, this is one of the earliest kind of descriptors that was, was even proposed for talking about texture. So what you end up with is this kind of thing where this is probably uh, P, for example, P11 for this image patch. It's to say, you know, if I have one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, or I guess five, if I have five different intensity levels, what's the probability that, or what's, yeah, what's the probability that I have a pixel at one location such that that is at intensity X and has, an inten has a pixel that's one down and one over that has intensity Y. So these things can be big and complicated, but they actually include a lot of information about the texture. Uh, more about co-occurrence matrices. They, they depend on um, a lot of different things, and they're kind of uh, brittle in that sense, but I'll let you read over that on your own time. Uh, but the important thing is that if you start with these matrices, you can then boil those things down further to come up with even more concise descriptions of what's in the texture. So the energy basically sums up all the elements of your co-occurrence matrix. Uh, and this gives you something about, tells you something about the dispersion of appearance. So if it's a very, very regular texture that keeps getting repeated exactly the same way over and over again, then the way you can think about that is that one of the elements in your co-occurrence matrix is going to have a huge number in it, and most of the other elements are going to be close to zero. So in other words, there's not going to be very much smear in it. And if that's true, then the entropy is going to be relatively low. Because if you recall, if something is low entropy, that means that it's relatively spiked. And if something's high entropy, that means it's relatively smeared. One other way to um, talk about stochastic and actually regular textures as well is to simply use what's called an autocorrelation function. And simply put, all you do is you take your, pat, your image patch and you make a copy of it and slide it on top of itself. And at each location, you correlate the first image with the second one. So that's what's called autocorrelation. It's correlating an image with itself. And for those of you who, uh, hopefully you learned about this in the statistics courses that almost all of you took. But if not, simply put a correlation of two signals that are identical to each other, whether they're images or not. The correlation between two identical things is one. Um, and the further they get from each other, the correlation goes closer and closer to zero. And in fact, if you have uh, two signals that are mirror opposites of each other, in other words, one of them's high when the other one's low, and the other one, one of them's low when the other one's high, the correlation goes negative. And so, for example, if you have a sine function, and then a sine function that is half phase off from it so that it's exactly opposite from each other, then the correlation of those two things is going to be negative one. So what you can do is look at the correlation of the image patch with itself as it is shifted on top of it. And what you'll notice if you do this is an interesting thing. Here what we've done is we've taken this kind of extended image patch here and, and done this autocorrelation thing where we shift it one, correlate, shift it another one, correlate. And what you'll see is that there's this repeated pattern of spikes in the correlation. And this corresponds to locations where the copy of the texture lines up, happens to line up really well with the original texture. So for example, where you see the green spike is where the copy of this guy lines up with this guy. 
And so this autocorrelation function, if you look at the peaks of it, it can tell you the, something about the degree to which the texture repeats itself and the ways in which the texture repeats itself in ways that you weren't really expecting. So we can see plainly that there are one, two, three, four repeated elements, and that when the copy of the image lines up perfectly well so that this guy lines up with this guy, then you get these big peaks. But you also get those red peaks, too. And what that corresponds to are locations where the copy of one of these big things lines up with this little sub-spike thing there. So from this, you can get other information about ways in which the texture pattern seems to repeat itself in ways that you maybe didn't model or expect. So that's what an autocorrelation function tells you. We talked about this when we discussed the Fourier transform, but just as a reminder, you can look at the Fourier transform of a texture image, and the Fourier transform can actually, the magnitude of the Fourier transform can actually tell you something about the image being strongly directional. And again, what I told you uh, probably on the second day of lecture was that uh, edges tend to be high frequency and they're oriented in a particular direction in an image like this. In fact, all of the edges are oriented in this orientation, which is to say the gradient is oriented in this location, in, in this orientation for all these pixels. And that's why you see this strong striping in this direction for this image. And similarly, for the American flag here, you can see that there are a lot of edges that go roughly more or less in this direction, which corresponds to high frequency components that are more or less in this direction, because that's the way that the gradient is going. So this is just a reminder. You already knew this, but you can use the Fourier transform to tell you something about texture as well. And this is just some more uh, examples. You can also use uh, banks of filter responses, as we've discussed earlier, as your texture descriptor. Here's some examples of that. Um, and I think I'll go quickly so we can look at a video, which I have here, which takes a couple of minutes. So just to summarize before I go into the video, um, textures, just to remind you, are repeated patterns of elements. And they lie somewhere on an axis between regular textures and stochastic textures with these near regular or somewhat regular textures being somewhere in the middle. If they're regular, then we think of this recipe of modeling the appearance of each one of the elements, the transformations amongst the elements, and then the grid that they lie on, which may or may not be deformed. And for stochastic textures, on the other hand, this process of thinking about the individual elements is so cumbersome that we tend not to. And we just think about how an abstract model generates the image patches corresponding to that stochastic texture. Any questions about this? OK, so uh, I'll switch to my video that a colleague of mine produced. And uh, right, I didn't think about the speakers, did I? Um, well, I'll start playing it and fiddle around with the sound, and hopefully you can kind of hear what's going on from my laptop speaker. This work explores techniques for manipulating you mere regular textures in novel ways. We manipulate textures with geometric, lighting, and color deformation fields. Here we demonstrate our algorithm for extracting and manipulating geometric deformation fields from a near regular texture. Relating this near regular texture to its regular origin, we first identify it. Oh, no. Oh, whoa. Look this at that. Explores techniques Oops. for manipulating near regular textures in novel ways. We manipulate textures with geom. Feel free to 
leave if you if you need to. But uh, I'll just show this for at least a couple of minutes.